Yes, no. Okay, so welcome to my talk, um, Investigating Paroskite Film Formation Using Optical in Situ Spectroscopy. Um, first of all, why are we interested in the film formation at all? Well, in these kind of semiconductors like perovskites or also organic semiconductors, the structural properties are well related with the optoelectronic properties. And the optoelectronic properties, of course, are decisive for the device performance. However, during the film formation, so in the case of perovskites, the material just forms before you have just the adducts. Perovskite forms only during the film formation. So obviously, the film formation is also decisive for the device performance. So if we understand the film formation better, we can better control the film formation. And this enables us to achieve targeted optimization of active layer properties. And hopefully it helps um, developing or adapting new processing methods, new materials, and it will enhance the reproducibility, especially from lab to lab. So talking about the film formation, there are many aspects which can be considered. It's starting with precursor treatment, then of course the coating itself, for example, spin coating, but also post-treating like thermal annealing. Um, we focus so far, or, or I focus today on the coating itself, especially on the spin coating. And we monitor that with optical in situ spectroscopy. That is simplified, we have our coating device like a spin coater, we have a wide light source, and then we have a laser and we are then able to record absorption and PL during the spin coating um, quite fast. Um, to, we do that frame by frame. So here in the upper panel, it's the case for a PL frame, the white light is off, the laser is on. The emitted light from the sample is collected by an optical fiber, led into a detection system. You have here a chopper wheel, and the light passes through this chopper wheel through a, a filter, which filters away the laser wavelength and is then led with these two mirrors and to a spectrograph. For the case of an absorption measurement, the laser is off, the white light is on, and this, this chopper wheel is in such a position that the white light is reflected to the spectrometer directly without this extra beam path. So by synchronizing um, laser, white light, chopper wheel and our detector, which is the CCD camera with the spectrograph, we are able to record absorption and PL frame by frame of frequency of about 11 hertz. Um, okay. Sometimes we also have some structures in our films which do not absorb or emit light in the visible range. Um, but if they form structures that scatter light, we can still record that we added therefore an extra LED um, and you can simply can record the intensity of this LED additional to the PL of the absorption. Um, okay, now let's go to an example. How do these spectra look? What can we get from the spectra? Um, a simple coating of this first guide is a one-step coating and look at the one-step coating of MAPI from DMF solution. One-step coating is simply you have all your adducts in a solvent, DMF, you spin coat it for a certain time, and you end up with a film. So for this system, it is known that the resulting film is not very nice. We have this needle structure here, which form, um, this is a solvent complex phase, so solvent molecules form a ordered structure with the adducts MRE and PBI2. And these solvent structures are then partly transformed to perovskite. Um, okay, for this coating, the typical spectra that we get look like this. We have here the photoluminescence as a function of time and energy displayed as a heat map. We have here the intensity of this additionally additional LED, so the, the scattered light. We have here the optical density. So we see already from this heat map that quite a lot is going on, but it's hard to tell in detail what's happening. So it is useful to have first a look at some spectra at specific times. And let's start with the optical density. And oh, my cursor is a little bit um, 
Uh, never mind. Um, okay, so we have, let's look at the spectra here before anything is apparently happening on the map. This, this black spectrum up here, it is rather flat, but we see some kind of modulation. And this modulation is it's not just a noisy background or something, but this is an, a signature of white light interference at the solvent layer. So depending on the thickness of the solvent layer on our substrate during spin coating, and depending on the wavelength, we can either have positive or negative interference, um, leading to a decrease or an increase of the optical density. Now, if you know the refractive index of your solution that is on top of the substrate, you can calculate the thickness of the layer based on the distance of this maxima. If we look at this part a little bit in more detail, you know, plotted in, uh, again, as intensity heat map, we see that these patterns evolve during the coating. And just by taking basically the distance between two maxima, we can estimate via this formula the thickness of the solvent layer during the spin coating, which is quite nice. Um, okay, going to the next spectra, this, this orange one and this blue one here, they are, well, rather flat spectra, a constant offset in the absorption. And this is the signature that some scattering objects form in the light path. And we know from the final film that this is, this is basically um, due to the formation of the solvent complex phase in this needle-like structure. And then only slowly at later time, the spectrum here, um, if you see the evolution of the absorption edge, this is basically the formation of the perovskite then. What you might see from this flat shape of the absorption, which does not really look like uh, the absorption of a nice final film, um, we can see that um, we have only a partial coverage of the um, substrate, which is for this system not surprising. As I mentioned, these needle structures form. And there's, if you're interested in this a little bit more, there's a nice work by Tian and Chaplikin, which discussed the influence of the coverage of the substrate on the resulting absorption spectrum. You can, in principle, also treat this and estimate from the spectra that we see the coverage and the thickness of the perovskite layer. However, um, put a little bit short, the values that we can extract, um, yeah, just more directly agree with the final values, values which are indicated here with these boxes. Okay, so far to the absorption. Now let's talk about the photoluminescence. Again, looking at the same spectra, uh, so at the very same times, this black one and the orange one, we don't see any PL at all. Then for the blue one, we see here, uh, broad peak at comparatively high energies. So normally for a final film, we would expect it to be around 1.6 EV. And during the spinning, this peak shifts to lower energies, gets narrow and increases. So this is a signature of um, quantum confinement. Um, if the domain size, or in this, in this case, the crystal size, is on the order of the spatial extent of the excited state, the excited state becomes confined and behaves very similar to the particle in the box model from quantum mechanics. And you, you may know from this, um, in this particle in a box model, the energy levels and also the distance between the energy levels depends on the size of the box. And likewise, there's a formula to describe the PL peak position, which is simply the value of the of the bulk PL, so where the bulk PL is, plus some constant over D squared, with D being the size of the crystal light. So from the peak position, it is possible to extract something like the average grain size. From the shape, it is also possible to extract um, something like a grain size distribution. Now, looking at the evolution of the grain size with time, we can get growth rates. And in this case, we saw here um, first fast growth and at later times a slower growth. And if you are a little bit more interested in this, 
um, it is uh, discussed in more detail in this work by uh, Christopher from the Eva Herzig group. And, um, okay, now we have looked at the spectra quite in detail. To quantify the dynamics of the film formation, it's very useful to consider um, time traces of the different optical quantities. So uh, here shown as a function of time, the intensity of the scattered light from this additional scatter LED, the optical density right above the band edge, and delta OD, it's basically how big is this band edge that we see. Um, okay, looking at these time traces, it is possible to identify different phase formations. So the first one is here at the moment where the scattering increases in both the optical density, and the C scatter. This is what we can associate with the formation of the solvent complex phase. Um, then we have here in the optical density again a small increase, very subtle. Um, this could be either due to more scattering or to absorption in the signal. But looking at the intensity of the scatter LED, we see a clear decrease of the signal. So we definitely have here absorption. And this is also the part, the time where we see the first PL signal. So we have here a first stage of perovskite formation, which is where the dynamics then change to a slower growth, the second stage of perovskite formation. Um, we can also then quantify the timings and this width, for example, by taking the derivative of this curve and fitting a Gaussian to the resulting peak. Um, yes, so far, so now that we have the tools um, to analyze the data, I want to go to a recent example. It's a recent study uh, from Simon Bieberger from our group. Uh, he investigated the influence of the ionic liquid on the film formation. So ionic liquids are used to passivate perovskites, so to improve the optical properties, basically. And to investigate the influence of the ionic liquid on the film formation, we looked at solutions with different ratios of the ionic liquid. And we also, since with the one-step processing, we get these yeah, not so nice films. We also had a look at the solvent engineering method. The solvent engineering method, method is a modification of this one-step processing, where the formation of the solvent complex phase is uh, inhibited by adding a so-called anti-solvent after certain times, which forces the edicts to crystallize in a, mostly in a very smooth way. So. To know when we need to drop the anti-solvent, we need to know when the solvent complex phases form. And it is um, and yes, yeah, so we first had to check whether the ionic liquid influences the formation of this solvent complex phase. So analyzing the data of this processing for the different ionic liquids liquid contents as I just have showed you with the example data. We can extract the time when the comp uh, solvent complex phase forms and also the time when the perovskite forms. And the width of this boxes is a measure for the time that it takes to form this crystal. We can also extract the growth rate from the PL peak position. And what we now see for the different concentrations of ionic liquid is that the formation of the complex phase is largely unaffected. However, the perovskite formation is delayed and slowed down by the ionic liquid. This is also reflected in the lower growth rates that we get the higher contents of ionic liquid. However, what we wanted to see is the complex formation is nearly the same for all uh, ionic liquid uh, concentrations, so we can choose the same times of anti-solvent dripping for all samples. Since it, the film formation depends on when you drop the anti-solvent, we wanted to investigate different timings, which is 6 seconds, 12 seconds, and 50 seconds after spin coating. 
um, the spectra during the coating for the solvent engineering shown here if again the photoluminescence is a function of time and energy the scattered light and the optical density and you might see directly that these look completely different from the ones that processing so here this white light a white line indicates the moment where we add the anti-solvent and right at this moment we get already a very strong pl signal this scattering signal from this additional LED vanishes completely and we get a quite nice and structured optical density. Looking at the spectra and the, of the optical density, these are shifted vertically for clarity. These are the first few frames after adding the anti-solvent. Um, we see here a flat baseline, so we have no scattering, then something like a kink and then an increase of the absorption. So this is this is the signature of the formation of a uh, small quantum confined peros peroskite crystallist with a certain solution. Um, I think this is quite nice to see. So no scattering. So we have obviously a formation of a quite homogeneous structure. OK, now looking at the growth dynamics, we have here the crystallite size extracted from the PL as a function of time for the reference solution, so without ionic liquid, for the different timings of the anti-solvent dripping. So here, six seconds, 12 seconds, and 15 seconds after the spin coating. And what we see is that for a later tripping times, the growth rates are way slower than for this six seconds tripping time. Why is this the case? Um, looking at the absorption in this high energy range around 2.8 V. Um, this is the energy range where some precursor states absorb. So it's the from bed, um, like PBI4 or something. You see at first, the corresponding signal decreases. This is because material is drawn off from the spinning substrate. But then this peak increases again. This can only be if new material, new PBI F4 minus or two minus, is formed. So we have a change of the precursor states here during the spin coating as the solvent evaporates. You can also see this in the spectrum. Um, this again, simply the optical density in this energy range. For this close to this six seconds is this black curve here. Then for 12 seconds, this peak is already higher. And at 14, 14 seconds, it's even higher. So very likely, um, the change of the growth rates is due to the difference in the precursor state. Now let's look at the effect of the ionic liquid, which we initially were interested in. For the case of the anti tripping of six seconds, we see again that the growth rate is reduced with more content of, anti uh, of ionic liquid. We hear the red one, the 1%, the one, the 5%. And this is also true for the other um, tripping times. Now, again, looking at the evolution of precursor states, we feel the optical density integrated in this range where this PBI4 to minus peak absorbs. As a function of time, we have at first this decrease because material is thrown away from the substrate, and then this increase because more of the species is formed. It is a little bit of pity that we don't have access to the concentration directly. But what you can see is for one timing, for example, for the one second, uh, for the six seconds, um, the higher the optical density at this energy, the slower the growth rate is. This is also true for the 12 seconds. Here, the black one and the red one are quite close together. Also, the corresponding growth rates are quite close together. So this suggests that the interaction of the ionic liquid with precursor states in the solution, even before the film forms, are likely uh, to change the crystallization dynamics and also the final film properties. Now, to verify this, um, let's do some cross check with ex situ characterization. <clears throat> um, as you may know, um, if we put MAI and PBI2 in the solution, they don't say MAI and PBI2, but they are rather present in something like MA plus and some Yodo Blumbard complexes like PBI4 to minus. 
And now to, one way to check the interaction of the ionic liquid, we have ions here, we have ions here, um, is to do um, solvent NMR. Um, in this case, they were performed by Helen Gröninger, also from the University of Bayreuth. And what we see from the fluor um, NMR drawing this BF4 part of the ionic liquid, we always get an upfield shift if MAI is in the solution. So this BF4 interacts with the MAI. And likewise, if we look at the um, HNMR or probing the acute part of this BMIM part or the lead MMI probing this Yodopin uh, blast species, we get an upfield shift um, when lead is in the solution. So this part, this BMMI plus, interacts with this BBI or minus or with this Yodopin blast complexes. So indeed, we have an interaction of ionic liquid with the precursor states, which is responsible for the change uh, of the growth rates and the crystallization dynamics that we saw. Now, how does this affect the final films? Um, so first of all, this ionic liquids is, or this ionic liquids is supposed to uh, passivate the film, so it should improve the optoelectronic properties. So if you look at PL or the final film, as expected, the PL intensity increases from the reference solution to the 1% ionic liquid to the 5% ionic liquid. And this can be also seen in the time resource PL, where we see a slower decay um, for high ionic liquid contents. So passivation works. That is nice. And looking at um, XRD by Nico Leupold, also from the University of Iowa, um, we see a decrease in the crane size, which is not what we want, actually, because it was reported in the past that uh, small cranes really show higher non radiative losses. And for solar cells, we want a pair of the big cranes. But we see also a decrease of um, strain in the cranes, which is um, yeah, good for, for improved stability of the sample. And the smaller cranes we also see in uh, SAM measurements. So here's the reference uh, film, um, quite big cranes, and they decrease with increasing ionic liquid. Um, possibly the size of this, the cranes is also related to the crystal growth rate. So it might be that there's room for improvement to um, yeah, change the pro processing in, in a way to um, speed up the crystallization of this high ionic liquid content. Okay, with that, I want to summarize my part at first, um, specifically on this part of the ionic liquid, how the ionic liquid influences the film formation processes. Um, we saw that the ionic liquid already interacts with the precursors in solution, but it has surprisingly no impact on the formation of the solvent complex phase. However, it somehow delays and slows down the perovskite growth. And as a result, we get smaller crystallites with more ionic liquid, which might ask for adaption of the processing for further optimization. Now, generally on the optical in situ spectroscopy, um, the optical in situ spectroscopy lies on the, relies on the known relationship between structural and optical properties. So if you don't know this relationship, you cannot uh, interpret the optical properties. Um, it is a cheap yet powerful method for investigating uh, the film formation. So how final film properties emerge and how they can be manipulated. And overall, this this method has a great potential for inline monitoring and also inline control because you can basically evaluate some of the optical properties during the processing and adapt the processing accordingly. However, you also need to be careful because too much light can alter the film formation. So the simplest um, example would be like laser heating. If you um, shine on it too uh, intense with the laser, the sample heats up and this changes, of course, Okay, with that, I want, want to thank the whole Periscite group, all collaborators that uh, took part in the work that I presented, 
Um, Simon Bieberger did most of the work, work of the second part that I showed you. And I want to thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions.